Good morning. Let's stand up. Get ready to worship.
So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your bed in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, you are
abundantly with you your grace is so good so we will keep singing and praising you and thanking you for all you've done for us even when we can't see it sometimes amongst all the the chaos everything that's distracting us Lord we know all good things come from you and so because of that, you deserve our praise. You are worthy of it all, Jesus. Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. We continue to look to you, Lord, and give you all the praise you deserve. And all of God's children said, thank you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to you that are here uh, uh, worshiping with us this morning at uh, the bridge. Glad that you're here. If you happen to be someone who's uh, visiting for the first time or perhaps you're circling back, and uh, we, we appreciate you coming. Um, we have uh, actually nothing to hide. I always invite people go ahead and, and check us out. And, and sometimes uh, more than one visit is required, is it not? Yeah, I think that's a prudent thing. That's a wise thing to do. And, and God will, will speak to you. And welcome to the rest of our Bridge Church family who are viewing us online. Uh, they're staying away out of an abundance of caution during these times. And we appreciate you looking in. And also folks that are not even part of this fellowship that are logging in and viewing us uh, each and every week. We appreciate that. God is good. Amen. All right, so I'm going to continue in our victory series, and I will be wrapping it up. Don't worry. It, 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 all good things come to an end. Um, trying to see which is the, the series that I'll make the longest. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's some, some in contention in there. But listen, uh, rather than having a, uh, a critical attitude like some of you are displaying now, 
I, 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 I do want us, uh, I mean, this will be exhausting. I mean, it's just a series called Victory. And um, I think God wants to teach his, uh, his children um, different ways in which you, we can walk uh, uh, this life out victoriously, right? I think he wants that. There's things that we're bound to get uh, down the road uh, in eternity, uh, but there's other things that he plans for us right now, and I think it's, it's good if we appropriate ourselves of what God has for his children. I think that that makes sense. The Lord wants us to walk in. He wants us to live in, and he wants us to live under his kingdom authority. Do you believe that? I mean, otherwise, why do we do what we do? He wants us to be uh, under uh, authority, kingdom authority. Now, you may not know this, but even from the beginning of the book of Genesis, he called for his people to be able to rule over and have authority over things, right? He's given us some things uh, that we're supposed to have authority. I don't know if you know that. Uh, uh, Christians are supposed to walk in that measure. Um, he is the overwhelming conqueror, and he lives in the, li in the lives of each and every believer, and we're supposed to be able, we have the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, right? That's what the Bible tells us. But here's the interesting thing. First, though, first, before we can be in authority over what he's given us authority to be over, we must be willing to be under authority whatever he's given us to be under authority to. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's a principle that's, that's found in, in all places, even in the secular world, even when it comes to faithfulness. If you're faithful in the little, you're going to be faithful in the much. But, but there's a good chance that if you're not faithful in the little, no one's going to entrust much to you. That's just a reality. That's a reality uh, in, in this uh, life that we live. So we have to be submitted. Now, I have to tell you, most people, most everyday people, will not have a problem having authority over things, over areas, or even people, right? I mean, there might be a few out there, but we're not going to have problems. We say, listen, I need you to have authority over this or that, that particular area or these particular people. Uh, most of us will say, okay, that's not a problem. Where do we have the difficulty? We have the difficulty in being under authority. That's just, that's a reality. That's just part of the flesh. That's just... That's part of that, 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 that nature that God had to exchange with us, but we still, have, we still have problems within our soul. Paul said, listen, I wish the things that I knew I had to do, I would do, and the things that I know I shouldn't do, I, I wish I didn't do them. That was Paul the apostle. And so, honestly, we have more of a difficulty in our soul now, in our soul, in being under authority. Why is that even important for believers to understand? Well, let, me, let me break it down real simple. God will never grant authority to any rebel. You're thinking, like, well, what is he talking about? Any rebel. Even a, even a, a, belie a, a person who calls on a believer, God is not going to grant authority to someone who is rebellious in his or her heart. Now, if I went around, or if you did... And you asked uh, believers, you took a random uh, poll of people, and uh, now, now I'm, I'm bringing it down to believers only, those who have professed faith in Christ. And if you asked them, took a poll and say, are you under God's authority, what would the answer be? But was, uh, of course. Again, you're asking believers this, you're not asking non-believers. I would say most, if not all, probably would say yes, because they say, well, duh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a little Christ, I'm a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, so of course I'm, I'm, I'm under his authority. Now, I flipped it, and I said, let's ask those same people, are, are you under authority of God's word? Now I'm wondering if the answer would be different. Would it be different? Think about that. Now, some people might answer right away, of, co of course I'm under authority, but the proof is in the pudding, is it not? Yep. You see, there's a God we don't see. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So unless you've had like an apparition, you're one of those lucky ones, whatever, I've not seen Jesus. 
I, I, I know I may look old to you, but I wasn't around more than 2,000 years ago. I did not see Jesus back then. Would I like to see Jesus? Yes, and there's a part of me that says, I don't know if I could handle it. Okay, Moses had problems with the presence of God, right? God had to kind of hide himself a little bit. He said, I'm going to kill you if I show you all of me. But, but would I like to have been around and walk with you? Of course, sure. But the, the issue, the reality is I don't, and, and neither do you, right? <clears throat> we don't see him. And so I wonder where we struggle as believers is we'll say that we're, we're accountable, submissive, and under authority to God, but I'm wondering how accountable, submissive, and under authority we are to God's word. And sometimes, sometimes there might be a difference in, in our mindset and the way we think. When Jesus Christ, who as the king of all kings and as the Lord of all lords is supreme, then I'm submitting to all of us that God's word is also supreme. While Jesus himself said, all authority, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, all. You know what all means in the Greek? All. All right, well, let's not go crazy. It, it means all. All authority has been given to Jesus Christ, all of it. That means to me that his word has the same level of authority. So I, I want us to think that. In our minds, sometimes we make a distinction between God himself and his word. But, but is there a distinction? Um, I'm going to try to answer that question for us uh, today. Now, people can do a lot of different things with the word of God, right? A lot of different things. They can approach it differently. Some, some people will actually hate the word of God because they hate God, and they'll even, by extension, hate God's people. You know that. I mean, there, there's hate there. Don't be surprised. They hated the Lord. And if they did that to the Lord, he said, what makes you think they're going to do any less to, to my servants, right? So that's a, that's a reality. So some people will just, they'll hate it. Some won't hate it, but they'll, they'll deny the word of God. They'll deny the authority of the word of God. How do I, why do I say that? Because some people will say, I, I can buy that, but I'm struggling with what it says here. Now, you know that that's true. We've all been there. They're, listen, do I like everything that the Bible uh, uh, talks to me about? No. In my soul, I don't. But in my spirit, I love it. And so in, in, in God's economy, that's the way it is. Some people will deny the authority of God. They'll deny the authority of his word. And then if I bring it down in further, talking to believers, believers now, believers. Some believers, and I'm saying people who have said they're believers, might want to distort the word a little bit. Maybe they're not even aware that they're actually distorting it while they're doing it. They're not aware of it. They might misuse it change it up a little here or there, misapply it. Now, I've seen that too. I, I've been in ministry quite a bit, and I've seen that where I'm telling you, people will explain to, things to me using a principle of God to justify an action or a behavior. And, and, and we have to be careful. And I throw myself in there. I have to be careful. I, I can be just as culpable of anybody of, of perhaps without even realizing it, distorting it, misusing it, abusing it, or so on and so forth. And then you have other believers that might look at the word of God and, and this is just what I think. Maybe they'll overanalyze it. You know what I mean? They'll, they'll, they'll make it out to be overly mystical. Uh, they'll spend their time um, splitting theological hairs, right, doing that more often than that, and miss out on the fact that the word of God really is a love letter. It's a love letter to his children. That's what it really is. Now, not everything in the Bible is good, but the word of God is good, but not everything in it is good. Why? Because he tells us good things and he tells us bad things. He tells us there's a bad news. The bad news is that if if you don't take me up on my offer, you're going to spend eternity in one place. The good news is that I've made provision for you to be able to accept my offer and spend eternity with me in my place. There's a whole lot of di difference. And sometimes, so, so people, uh, uh, people miss out that it's, it's a love letter written to God's children, written to everybody who loves God and is called according 
uh, to his purpose. It's like looking at the Bible, just reading it, just reading it. There was a time that I just read the Bible, but I can tell you, I know now, it wasn't producing life in me. I, I just read it, just like reading words. And some people will look at it and look at it and just see, like if you're a musician, they'll see song sheets, but they'll miss the music and the melodies behind it. And I think that's important for us to know that there is actually a God, a real God, a personable God, a God that loves you, champions you, wants the best for you and I. And he wants you and I to, to read his word with that mindset and not just look for the notes, so to speak, but see, let's hear the music play. All those things of how people approach the Bible, true, there, there, there are more. But I want to highlight one that probably for believers is the worst. And that would be to, for a believer to disregard the word. To disregard the word. And what I, what I mean by that is this. Listen carefully. What I mean by that is this. Is for some to claim to believe it, but yet know very little of it. Because believers are, are, believe and We'll, we may talk about the Bible here and there. Uh, we'll claim to believe it. And I'm not chastising anybody. I'm just telling this is a reality. But we know little of it. We don't even know what's in there. Now, I watch a good deal of news. Regular, you know, news. I do. I watch it, keep up with the times. But it wouldn't do me any good if I spent more of my time believing the news rather than believing the word of God. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I can, I can actually sit there and go ahead and, and just believe you. So I'll watch the news, but it would be erroneous on my end if I'm going to go ahead and believe all the news that I'm watching and not believe the good news of God. See, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it just, it, it won't work. It won't work if we praise God, lift up Jesus high, See him enthroned on the praises of the people. Say that we love him. Put a Bible verse on our bumper sticker. Do all those, those things. And yet we fail or refuse to hold the same regard and esteem for the word of God. Now this is a Bible-believing church, in case anybody wonders. Well, what kind of church are we? We believe the Bible. Yeah, yeah, but what? Yeah, we believe the Bible. Yeah, we have a mission statement, building Bridges tearing down walls, uh, but, but we believe the Bible. We stand about all the Bible, all the Bible. So I don't want I don't want anybody to be mistaken here and get confused and saying, well, well, there's some things in the Bible I'm not in agreement with. Take it up with him. That's what I say. Take it up with him. I got problems with them too. I have to take it up with him. But it's either all the word or none of it. Otherwise, we're left to pick pick and choose, right? So. Let's take a closer look at Scripture, and, and, and I want us to see what the Word says about the Word, okay? I'm going to give you one bullet point, two sub-points, and here we go. Here's the, here's the bullet point. Both Jesus and His Word, I want, to, I want to draw a parallel now between Jesus and His Word, the Bible, the Word of God. Both Jesus and His Word, here's the first one, are inseparable. They're inseparable. Jesus and his word are one. What is the beginning of the gospel account of John said? You guys know this. In the beginning was the word, right? And the word, capital, was with God and the word was God. That's, that's what it says, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, referring to a person, the word was with God and the word was God. And later on in verse 14, it says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now look up at the screen, Revelation 19, 13. Look at what it says. And, and I want you to take my word for it now, but later on I do want you to check it out because we want you uh, to go ahead and not just accept as lip service anything that I'm saying and everything. But I, I'm guaranteeing you this scripture has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 13. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, 
and his name is called what? The word of God. That, it's talking about Jesus. So Jesus in Revelation, his name is called the word of God. Now he's got many names, but we're just looking about, about the Lord himself and about the word of God. There's things that I, I can't give them all to you, but there's some things that are parallels between Jesus and his word that, that are the same. See, the Bible tells us this, that in Galatians, I believe, 4.4, 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, right? Born of a woman, born under the law, right? He sent him. So who sent Jesus? The father sent Jesus. God the father sent the son. He was sent. And yet there's a Psalm 107 where it says the word, he sent his word and healed them. He sent his word and healed them. And that's Jesus and he sent his word. Let me tell you something right now. If you're in need of healing, if you're not feeling all great, if you're viewing online and you're not feeling good, how about extending some faith right now? I'll just take a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all other names, you declared in your word that you sent your word to heal them and deliver them from every destruction. Not only did you save our souls, Lord God, not only... Have you put eternity in our hearts? Not only are we called to prosper spiritually, but we're also to prosper mentally, emotionally, and physically. And right now, while there is faith, Father, would you send your word right now by your Holy Spirit and touch any and all persons who are awaiting your touch, who want to be healed in some form or fashion. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And heal them and touch them now so that you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So God sent the Son and the Lord sent the Word. Jesus, God, cannot be changed. Malachi says, for I am the Lord and I change not. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same. Yesterday and today and forever. Why is that there? Because every second that, and every moment that we think, oh, God changed on me, look again, chances are you changed on him. The Lord's not going to change. The Trinity is not going to change. They're not, they're not going to change at all. And what about the word? Well, Jesus said, listen, until heaven and earth pass away, not every, not even the littlest letter, the smallest letter or, or stroke, none of it is going to pass until, uh, from the law until all is accomplished. It doesn't matter how much you and I may try to change the word or alter the word, it's not going to happen. The word is going to stand as it is. You either believe it or you don't. But what you cannot do, what I cannot do is pick it apart and decide which part I want to believe and which one I don't. Corinthians 10 says that these things were written for us as example, the good things and the bad things. Amen? What about light? Okay. Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. That's what he said. And Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus is light. The word is light. In the real Lord's Prayer in John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Talking about disciples then and disciples to follow. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. But what did Jesus say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. His word is truth. God is truth. You say, well, no, I'm accountable. I'm under the authority of Almighty Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's going to say, okay, I right. Apply the word. A little dab will do you. 
little dabble, do you? Do the, do, do the word. Why am I sharing scriptural examples of how Christ and his word are inseparable? Because I, I, I think the problem sometimes is with our mindset. We'll say we have total allegiance to God, but the proof is in the pudding and how we relate to his word. But here's why I share it. This might be worth, I don't have it up on screen. Here's my reason. Because if you believe in one, Christ, then you must believe in the other, his word. You cannot say you believe in the Lord and yet say, I don't believe all of his word. If you believe in one, you've got to believe in the other. You know, we can take any book. Any of you like to read books? Some avid, anybody? Avid read a couple? Yeah, okay. My wife is an avid book reader. I'll use the excuse, I just don't have time. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make time. But I'll make time first for the word of God. That's not trying to be holier than thou. But we read words when we pick up other books on us. And yet the Bible, the word of God, is the one that can read us. So other books, we read words in them. But this book, the book, the holy word of God can read my life and can read yours as well. Now, even though God and his word cannot be changed, even though Jesus and his word are inseparable, both Jesus and his word also, and here's the second one, produce undeniable change. What do I need that? They're inseparable, but they each also produce undeniable change. It works together. One, Jesus is the word, and the word is the Lord. What do I mean by undeniable? Meaning that it's ir irrefutable. Meaning that um, you can't disprove it. It can't, it can't be explained away. Now, people will try to explain away the word of God. They will they'll try to say, what about this? This was written by man. Well, that, that's easy. You'll, you'll see later on. I mean, we know already that man wrote it, but the old Holy Spirit authored it. The Holy Spirit uh, spoke to men. He go, well, how do you believe that? That's where it takes faith. Those that come to God must first believe that he is, right? And so, I mean, I come to God and I'm saying, okay, I'm directed to his word. And then as time goes on, the Holy Spirit begins to kind of unfold the word of God to me and to you. Uh, that's, that's what's happened. But rather than talking about disproving the words or, or the Bible itself, you can't deny that it's the most read book in world history. It's the most mass-produced book in world history, in the history of mankind. Been translated in so many different languages. I don't have the figures. I'm sure some of you do. Um, but for anybody that speaks a certain dialect or language, I'm sure they can find the word of God translated for them. Undeniable change. What do I mean by that? How did you come to Christ? Um, don't answer. It's a rhetorical question. But how did you come to faith in Christ? How did I come? The Bible says, Paul writes in Romans 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall what? Be saved. Wh whoever calls, right? But wait a second. What made you and I even call on God? What, what made us call on God? Paul in that same chapter says, man, the word is near you, both in your mouth and in your heart. It's near you. It's right around the corner, he's telling us. And he describes it as the word of faith, which we are preaching, Paul and others. He's saying, this is the word we're preaching. It's near you. It's near in your heart. It's near in your mouth. A believer is called a believer because a believer believes, right? That's not a, a believer believes. But Paul also says in that same chapter that we wouldn't have called on the Lord, right, unless we first believed. But then he goes on to say we would not have believed unless we first heard. And we wouldn't have heard unless someone came and shared the good news or preached the good news to, to us. Now, you may be a different sort of animal. Maybe your story is, I mean, it's one in a million. But I believe everybody at some point, it doesn't matter if you heard preaching from a pulpit and people think that's the only preaching there is. No, it isn't. You might have heard preaching. Preaching means that somebody 
was sharing the good news with you one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five or whatever it was. You heard it. Maybe you heard it one time. Maybe you heard it multiple times. The first time it did, but you just, you kept coming back. You kept coming. You don't even know why you came back. God knows why you came back, but you and I didn't know why we came back. It happened that way to me. Somebody shared the good news. And he goes on there in Romans 10 to say, even, even though not all received, right? And that's the same today. See, it, it's not up to us to save people. It's not up to us to save people. You and I don't save people. God saves people. The Holy Spirit draws people. We can't save people. Our, our attitude needs to be one of obedience where we share the good news because we buy into the good news. Some water, some plant. God is the one that causes the growth internally inside of one person and corporately of, of his church overall, his universal church, the body of Christ. Well, we have, our obligation is to share. And, and I, I remember years ago, there was such a press to get people to say a faith prayer. So it would count, be counted as a stat. Listen, I'm, I almost fell into that trap. Almost, somewhat, a little bit. It, it sounded good. How, how many came to the Lord? It was, it was good stats. I'm not interested in stats about me. I really want to make it all about the Lord. So the way I view it is I give the word of God. I preach the word. And I, I'll tell you this, and, and this is the truth. There could be a thousand, five hundred thousand, a million better preachers than me. There's no ego here. But of this I'm confident. If I preach the word of God, that's what I'm preaching, and the glory goes to the Lord. He gets the glory. If you preach the word of God, it's the same thing. You're preaching the word of God. He gets the glory. It's the word of God. Now, you may like some styles more than others, this and that. Oh, okay, okay. But I'm not interested in false conversions. I'm not interested in people, including pastors, manipulating somebody to say a prayer of faith. If God, by his spirit, doesn't draw you to respond, who am I to make you? Does that make sense? You got to make that decision. That goes for young people, old people, in between people. It, it goes to all people. You got to hear the word of God. But think about it. You came to God because at some point, one day, over multiple days, you heard the word and then you responded. There was something about the word. The word was anointed. Not so much the vessel, although I count on his anointing, and so should you. But it was the word itself was powerful. The word was alive. That's why he says later in 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So all we have to do is share it and those that hear it have a decision to make. It either makes sense, they exercise faith towards it or not. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ. But what's the undeniable change? The proof of God's word, listen, is in the heart of every believer. There's the undeniable change. It's in the heart of every believer. So all those times that you heard the word or you heard it once and the Holy Spirit drew you and then you responded with faith after hearing the word of God. Here's a correlation. People who knew you and I before that historic event in our lives, once they run into you, they cannot dispute that something has happened to you. If they cannot tell that something has happened to you, I uh, respectfully submit something might be wrong. I'm not telling you the first day. I've shared this before. When I, man, I wasn't even going to a church. I accepted the Lord. And then I found church on TV. And looking back, maybe it wasn't the best, but it kept me going. So I'm not going to poo-poo it. It drew me closer to God. I, I was falling in love. But not overnight, I, I, I began to change. The change goes inside. I told you this story. And then the people that I used to hang with no longer found me fun. 
Now, it wasn't that I became a prude. It wasn't that, but I, I fell in love with somebody. I was in love with my wife, but I, I fell in love with somebody. And I just said, man, fellas, I, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. There was nobody around to tell me, don't do that. You're sinning. It was a change. And so one time when I went back to New York after many, many years, I told you that before. We were in the car and they were passing around the doobie. You know what I mean, the doobie? You know what I'm talking about, right? Because I was known for those doobies. And one of my friends already knew how to change, but the one passing it around didn't know. There's a big haze in the car. Big haze. <laughs> and he turned, passed it to me, I said, no, it's, it's okay. No. He almost choked. I said, what? The other guy told him, no, no, man, he's, no, nah, he's, he's, he said, what happened? I, I didn't get religious on them. I didn't condemn them. I said, no, it's cool. You know, do what you got to do. And I, you know, there's nobody around. My wife wasn't there to watch me. And yeah, I mean, it was just me. I just, I knew instinctively I had changed. I was different. God had performed something in me was undeniable. And I bet it's, it's with most, if not all of you. And, but here's the thing. At some point, you fell in love with him too. You fell in love with the one who gave himself up for you. And Jesus became undeniable to you. Once you, you hooked up with him, he became undeniable. You couldn't deny him. You couldn't deny the reality of what you believe by faith God had done for you. And then what ends up happening is the effects of Christ produce also a change in us that's undeniable. It will not happen necessarily overnight. With some people, it could be a radical change. But with others, it might be gradual. Christ begins to formulate change in you. 1 Peter 1.23. Look what Peter says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, for you have been what? Born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, and then he describes what the seed is. Through the living and enduring what? Word of God. You were born again from the Word of God. Now, you were made alive by the Holy Spirit, okay? But you were born again because you heard the Word of God and you responded to the Word of God and he says, listen, this is not a, a word that's perishable. It's, it's imperishable. But also it is living. It is living. It's the living word of God. So if that's you today, you were born again through the word of God. So was I. And then that change continues to happen because we're not a finished product, right? That change continues to happen with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course, but with the Word of God. It, the Spirit who will guide us into all truth. What's the truth? The Word of God. Thy Word is truth. And so, to say we are accountable, we're under the authority of God, and yet not know. Now, I'm not telling you that everybody here knows every little word written in the Bible. The Bible is pretty big, right? But if, if you disregard it, if I watch more news and believe the news more than believing the word of God and pay no attention to it, what good is that going to do me? What good would it do you? It wouldn't do you any good. And so that's why we read in, in, in Hebrews 4.12 that the word is what? Active. It's active. There's an energy to it. It's living. And just like in 1 Peter 1, 23, the word is living, it's active. It tells us that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's going to cut on both sides. It's going to divide, uh, it says the division asunder. It's going to divide soul and spirit. 
So you and I will know when it's the spirit part of you talking and when it's the soul part of you talking. It's going to divide joints and marrow. It's even going to distinguish the thoughts and intentions of your heart and mind. That's how powerful, how alive, how active the Word of God is. Now, the more we give ourselves to the Word, I would think the more we fall in love with Jesus, the more that the Word is made alive in us, and it, and it cuts us, and we understand it's painful, but, 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 but God himself, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Listen, I'm going to prune you. How many of you know, well, none of you are, are flowers or plants, but pruning hurts. There's a little bit of hurt, but then it's all good. Then it's all good. Is this making sense? I mean, what constitutes the church anyway? What constitutes its members? I'm talking about the church universe. What constitutes the members? Well, I'll tell you what. The word of God produces members of the church, members of the body, of the body of Christ. It's, you say, yeah, it's the word that produced you. You heard the word, you came to the word, you believed in who the word was talking about, and you come to find out that the word and the Lord are one and the same. The word is the Lord, the Lord is the word. I'm going to make a statement, see if you catch it. I should have put this up. If you're born once, you die twice. If you're born only once, you will die twice. There is a natural death, and it's what we call a spiritual death, which is, means separation from God. The word death means separation. So there's a physical separation. So if you're born once, and everybody who ever was was born, then you, you're, you're doomed to have two deaths. But if you're born twice, you will only die once. Uh, man, that's what I'm talking about. You were born again. You were born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. You were born again through the living, enduring word of God. So you're born twice. If you are born again, that means you're now born for the second time. And rest assured, you will only die once because you will never be separated by God for, with God from all eternity. You will be with him. So you'll only die once. Make sense? I vote for being born twice. 2 Corinthians, you know these verses, 5, 16, and 17. Therefore, because everything that was written prior to that, therefore, from now on, but I love these, there's two therefores in here. From now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. No one. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we, we, don't, we don't longer know him in this way any longer. No longer. We're going to know him the same way. He came. He walked the earth. He did ministry for 30 plus odd years. And then he ascended from them, said goodbye to his disciples. Then he sent his Holy Spirit. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that should mean any and all believers. If anyone is in Christ, you know this, he or she is a new creature. They are a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is why it's important that if you are, if you are identity stricken, if you're in a place where you know, people say, I, I don't know who I am anymore. There are a lot of people in the world like that. They need the word of God. Because the word of God is what you and I need to tell us who we are in Christ. The world may say you're a loser, but God say we're a winner if we're with him. The world will be afraid of, of death. But the believer will know that death has lost its sting. Oh, death, where is your victory? You can take my life, but this will be the one life I give up, but I'm spending eternity with him. I'm not looking to leave any earlier. What I'm saying to you is when I go, when I go, 
I am believing that I will be absent from the body, but present with the Lord. And that's why it's important why we should not look at each other after the flesh no more. It wasn't my friend's fault. I mean, we hadn't been around for years. Went back to visit. He was just passing me the doobie. It's something that I had done all the time, something I was known for, famous for in the neighborhood. But I was no longer to be, he didn't know that was to be, I'm no longer to be recognized in the flesh. And when you and I look at each other, we should not recognize each other in the flesh, but recognize who you are in Christ Jesus. Paul could confidently say, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the faith that I have, I have in the Son of God who gave himself up for me. Amen? Amen. Don't let the devil tell you you're this or you're that. Why don't you ask God what he thinks of you? God produces change. He produced a change in Jacob, right? A liar, a supplanter, a deceiver. Until God changes that doesn't mean now we got to go change our names. Because there's something spiritual that happens. He used a guy that you see, how, how could he be fit to serve God? Well, the same thing, how can I be fit to serve God? How can you? Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We've got nothing to offer him, but he's got everything to offer us. And when sin is knocking on your doorstep and mine, we got to declare what the word says. Listen, buddy, I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. I understand I'm being tempted. But Father, I pray, provide a way out, a way of escape. With every temptation that comes my way, that's scriptural. That's the word of God. 1 Corinthians 10. And the good thing is that even when we do succumb, maybe give in and lose some resolve on the way, if we really are for God, I can tell you God is really for us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The old things have passed away. Behold, things, new things have come. The word is important. That's why God in Isaiah talks about his word. He talks about the same way that, that the snow falls down and the rain and waters the earth. He says, man, that's the same way my word will, is going to go forth. It's going to go forth. And it will not be made void. It will not return to me until it accomplishes the purpose for which I sent it. That word of God cannot return to God empty. Cannot return to him void. It's going to succeed. God has an incredible bat batting average. It's a thousand. A thousand. Not me, not you, but he bats a thousand. Amen? Amen. How can some people then, believers, say they believe but display no change? I'm not talking about overnight. That's where we've we got to be careful. We're not judgmental. We're not haughty. Oh, why are you doing that? A person needs to be able to grow. But I'm talking about you, you're saying you believe, but somehow there's no change displayed. I'm not talking about, I usually say this, about talking in King James English. That's ridiculous. Who talks like that? It's not about wearing a clerical robe or praying cards or acting mystical like this. What, what is that? How can some say they believe but display that change? Let me ask you something. If we're not displaying any change or any growth, would that be God's fault or our fault? Okay, so you're, it's our fault. Yes, I agree, it's ours. 
We have to receive and obey both the Lord and his word. And so I think sometimes in our mindsets, we'll say, yeah, Lord, I believe you. Right, because you are not seeing him. But if you open up the word of God, you and I will see him. But I know what sometimes we do. We won't open up the word of God. And you know why? I know I'm being cynical. I'm being cynical to you online too. Because sometimes we already know what we're going to read. And we'd rather not read it. And rather not get convicted. And rather not be accountable to it so we don't read it. We know what it says. And when you ask someone to pray for you, some people will, will ask for somebody that doesn't even know the word of God. But they don't want to go to so, a brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so because they'll know the word. And you know they'll know the word, but you don't want to hear it, so you don't want their prayers. Huh? I know they don't preach this in seeker-friendly services, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not here. Listen, I'm all for seekers, very much so. But I'm not going to water down the word of God. James says in humility, in James 1, in humility receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to do what? Save your soul. Man, receive the word implanted. I mean, we'll talk more about that next week. That means it's got, it's got to get in there. It's got to receive the word. In humility, receive it. We talked about humility already. In humility, acknowledge that um, we're nothing. We really need him. So in humility, man, I need the word. And so I'm going to take the word at what it says. I'm going to pray about it, meditate on it, really meditate on it. And then have the Lord produce whatever change he wants produced in me. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not a finished product. Anybody here a finished product? Anybody? No, but I'm not. I need all the help I can get. You say, wow, you're kind of a scary person to be pastoring a church. No, you better, you may not be here. Man, I, I, don't, I don't pastor the whole city. I'll pastor whatever people God has here for me. That's why you that are listening online, you're accountable for the word I'm preaching today. Receive the word implanted. Engraft the word of God, which is able, able to save your soul. But he goes on to say, but prove yourselves to be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only, lest you be deceived or deluded. Prove yourselves to be, we got to do the word. The people say, I'm not changed yet. Do the word. It's not easy. Never said it was. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prophesy. It's not going to be easy. Is that, take care of it? I'm going to prophesy right now. We'll take care of it. It's not going to be easy. It's not easy for anybody. Prove yourselves and be doers of the word and not hearers only, lest you be deser uh, deceived or deluded. There's a proverb not up on screen. Proverbs, if you're taking note, Proverbs 30, verse 6. Do not add to his words, capital H, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. It goes back to that distorting. Don't, don't, don't add to his words. Don't, don't make it something that'll prove your doctrinal viewpoint take the full counsel of the word of god that's what i tell people you got to look at the full counsel of the word of god anybody i repeat anybody can take one scripture and build a theology out of it and many have done you know what's appalling to me because you know i don't like cowards but there he goes again i see a lot of cowards i see a lot of cowards in the news cowards cowards Cowards. And by everything I've seen around you in the public life, whoever you are, you have the audacity, you have the nerve to quote the word of God. When I have to know, and I don't need any big, deep spiritual revelation, you don't know anything about the word of God. 
but you're using it as an opportunity to say, show yourself scriptural and appear pious. Are you kidding me? God isn't going to let that pass. Don't add to his words. Don't do it. He'll reprove you. Don't violate his words. Don't misuse his words. If you're not even born again, Jesus says that at the end he will say, depart from me. Wait, wait a second. Lord, Lord, we, we did these things in your, in your name. We did these things. He said, depart from me, wick, uh, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Again, not, not a kind of word you're going to get in a seeker-friendly service. Now, I don't always like this if you're a guest here today. I don't want to scare you. You know, God loves you with an everlasting love. God is love. Jesus wept. I give you all those. I've given them before, okay? I've given them before. But you got to give the full word. You got to give the full word. Our God is merciful. He's compassionate. He's loving. He's forgiving. He's full of grace. He gives us grace. Yes, he's also a holy and righteous God. He is that. Oh, we want to throw that one out the window. I'm tired of seeing officials quote the word. Now, I don't know all of them, but I'm telling you, man, I've seen you over the years. You're a hypocrite. And that goes for pastors in pulpits who won't preach the truth. Because they don't want to offend and see a backdoor revival. Those of you that know me, you think that I want to offend? Of course not. It's crazy. That'd be stupid. But I have a choice to make. I was sharing with my son recently. There was a decision that I did not make sooner, and I lamented it. He said, oh, God, oh, it's nothing personal. It's a, it's a decision as a, as a pastor that I did not make, that I ended up making, but I should have executed it. Now, if I tell you what it is, like I told him, he said, all right, not, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. But it weighed heavy on me. It weighed heavy on me. I knew better. First Thessalonians 2.13. I'm starting to lose the voice. First Thessalonians 2.13 up on screen. For this, this is Paul again, another letter to another bunch of Christians. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you what? Accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you, who what? You who believe. Well, why, why didn't it work? Why didn't it work on uh, Tommy over here, or or Nancy over here? I don't. I don't know. I'm not going to judge it between them and God, but I don't know. I believe the Word of God will will accomplish its work in those who believe. He says, Paul's saying, we gave you the Word of God. We preached the Word of God to you, and you not you didn't accept it as as words of men or my word. You accepted it for what it really was: the Word of God. When the word of God is preached, there is anointing, there is power, there is liberty, there is freedom. Huh? All those things. There's victory in the word of God. Uh, one that I always call Philippians 2.13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Not ours? No. No. It's okay to have some pleasurable things, enjoy oneself. But it's God who's at work in you. How's he at work in you? The word is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's working. It's producing something in you. Don't resist. It's like the most Star Trek movies, the Borg. Resistance is futile. It's futile. Just give in to the word, man. Let the word accomplish, accomplish his work. God is good. Last scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. These are known to you. All, does it say all? Remember, what does it mean in the Greek? All. All scripture. 
even the bad, that all of it is inspired. It is breathed by God. It is God breathed. God breathed by the Spirit. The Spirit breathed, okay, gave life to these scriptures as he had men write down the words. It is inspired by God and it's profitable. Huh? Everybody likes a prophet? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. Ooh, ah, correction. For training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be adequate. Equipped for every good work. What good work? The work God wants you to do, whatever it is, for God is at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. I have a question. Is God, the God you serve, you serve, is he the God of all truth? A few of you. Okay, he's the God of all truth. I believe he is. I believe he is. He's the God of all truth. Let me ask you something. Is he capable of inspiring error? Why would he give breath of life to that? His word is alive. The same way we created man, he breathed into him. And the man became a living soul, nefesh, a living soul. And now, when we are born again, he breathes into you. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of you. And where the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, he may guide us sometimes when we're not reading scripture, but many times what he does is he quickens to our minds. Doesn't he? Doesn't he quicken to your mind? A scripture come alive and you'll think of this. You say, oh my God. He's not going to inspire error. That's why man, Jesus said, shall not live by bread alone, but by every single word every single word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Amen? Can we stand to our feet? Our God is good. And, 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 and if all this time you were like perfectly like, you know, in tune with, uh, with God and his word, I, I, I'm just telling you that for me it's very easy to get lost in it. And I'll say that I'm I'm under allegiance. I'm under the authority of God himself. Uh, but I don't, I don't seem to have perhaps the same regard for the word of God. And, and what I've preached to you today is what I have to preach to myself. I want to have the same regard for the word of God. I want to stand on the word of God. He sent his word to heal me, not just physically, mentally, emotionally. If people have done you harm, if your mom or dad wasn't the best parent, they're still in hope because you have a heavenly father who loves you. If you feel that you've, you've just turned away from God, the same way, the same strength that it took you to turn away from God, you can apply the same strength and turn back to God. And God will welcome you back. And so, Father, this morning, we ask that your word per would perform its work in us who believe, whether in this sanctuary, across the city, county, state, nation, world. I pray that you develop a hunger in us. I'm asking you to, to give us a hunger for your word because your word is all about you. You and the word are one, you're inseparable. And you produce undeniable change. And people will no longer understand who we are or why we are the way we are. But maybe, maybe perhaps, there is just something in us that will draw them to Christ. I pray that we not think that they're drawn to us. But I pray that they would be drawn to the Christ who is in us, the hope of glory. Thank you for sending your word. Sending your son. Thank you, Father, that your word will not return void. It will not come back empty to, to you. It will accomplish the very thing for which you sent us. I pray that we would grow, that we would develop much good for bear much fruit, Lord God. That we would develop the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. That we would mature, that we would see others come, and that they would grow, be made disciples of Christ. We ask these things, Father, 
as you're with us for the rest of this week until we meet together again. I ask for a hedge of protection around all the families, every single person, every parent, every child, every teenager. I pray that there will be an awakening of hearts and an appreciation for who you are. We're asking, as always, Father, for this nation to turn back towards you. That you are to have preeminence. You are to have first place in all things. That we are to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And that then all these other things will be added. I pray that you would knit our hearts, make our homes stronger, God-fearing homes. Not Pharisaic homes, God-fearing homes. People that love God and are loved by God and share the love of God freely. I pray that you would loosen the lips of the shy person who feels they don't know enough scripture, Father. But they know more than they think they know. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would bring it out of them. You would grant us divine appointments to come across people that are looking for answers that cannot be found in solutions that mankind comes up with. We need you, and we need you alone. Give us victory through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next week. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Keep the love oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, and forever I'm changed. When I stand in that place, free at last, Meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive, and he's alive.